Hi everyone, it's Amy here from the blog I Think Therefore I Teach. Welcome to part two of Unit 3 1.2. Now this is such a huge topic that I've done it in two different sections. So this one is for uh, assessing the usefulness of investigative techniques in criminal investigations. So this video is going to focus on profiling and interview techniques. So let me make myself smaller and we'll get straight to it. Let me just find the slide that we need. Please find the video on YouTube as well. There we go, profiling. Right, so profiling techniques. Profiling is split into four different sections. Profiling is a huge area but a very interesting one. So this looks at what characteristics might you link with a typical offender according to biological individuals and sociological. So we're bringing back a bit of unit two here now um, because a lot of what happens in the second year is synoptic. So we draw upon a lot of work from the first year to help develop us further. Profiling is based on the idea that previous knowledge can let us predict the sort of person who might have committed an offence. What profiling does is it tries to work out um, who the offender might be, who the criminal is, who has done the act um, of murder, for example. So this is where you put a profile to who you think you might be looking for. It uses analysis of patterns of behaviour or personality characteristics. It also uses previous offenders and previous crimes. And so the four types that we're going to work through now are typological, clinical, geographical and investigative psychology. So we're going to work through what each of these are. We're also going to get um, examples and case studies for each and then evaluate. So this, as I said, is a huge section, but it's really interesting. So always follow it along the top because I will always make it clear what section we are actually looking at. So this is the first one. This is a typological profiling. This looks at the actual crime scene itself to yield evidence about the offender. So to get a type. The crime scene might indicate something about the motive, personality and lifestyle. Criminal consistency is the idea that how a person commits crime tells us something about how a person behaves in other areas of their life. So I discussed at this point with my students what a crime scene might tell you about the person that's done it. So they talked about things like um, whether um, they can, you can tell if it was, um, oh, what's the word? off the cuff, not planned, uh, um, uh, accidental, or whether it was planned, organised. Um, so it would might be lead to whether it's kind of manslaughter, something that just got carried away in the situation, or whether it was actually first degree murder, whether it was planned, organised. So you can tell a lot from the crime scene about what the offender's intentions might have been. So was it organised or disorganised? And again, we discussed what would an organised crime scene look like? What would a disorganised crime scene look like? It's organised, things are tidied away, cleared away, the weapons taken, um, minimal mess that maybe the person, uh, if we are in a murder case, the person maybe only has minimal serious wounds rather than if it's more disorganised, they may have a lot of um, minimal cuts and bruises and scrapes if there was a bit more of a scuffle. Um, disorganised, they might leave things, they might figure get to do things they might be more visible so the way that they've broken in for example um what does the organized or disorganized nature of the scene say about the murder and how they might behave in other contexts so chances are if they're an organized killer they might be organized in their everyday life as well for example so those questions are good ones to ask in your uh, grid on your in your in, in your assessments and to write on your grid sheets they're also good to think about actually answering and what the potential um, disorganized or organized criminal might be like so there's two types of profiles we're going to look at here rapist and murderer so for example a rapist there are two types of main rapist profiles the first is power assertive this is where the rapist uses rape to dominate now rape in most cases is not sexual it's not about a sexual act it's about a dominant it's about an act of asserting your dominance over another individual it's a chance to express their masculinity now i put masculinity in inverted commas because obviously 
masculinity implies men, ma a man on a female or a man on a man, but of course there is the other option of female on man, which is not always as recognised though. The goal is to conquer and control, moderate to high aggression, use of force, and it tend the person tends to be in a relationship but has serial marriages that fail, macho jobs, again, whatever you class as a macho job. Image conscious, physically abused as a child, comes from a single parent family. So these are the sorts of profiles based on stereotypes. So profiling is very much stereotyping. That's what profiling is. You then have power reassurance type. The rapist is driven by feelings of sexual insecurity. So they often reassure the victim, I won't hurt you. They may even compliment them, reassure them and even be apologetic. Low aggression tends to be single, living alone or with parents, low paid occupation, socially awkward. So this in, rape in this case is where somebody may be sorry that they're doing it, but they just can't stop themselves. They just can't help it. Um, so this is why when um, getting reports of a rape from the individual, from the victim, it's so important to understand not only the physical wounds, because that might show the aggression of the rape, but also if they spoke to them and what they said. Murder profiles organised might uh, be evidence of carefully planned control of the victim, removal of evidence. So control of the victim meaning, again, as I've said, that the wounds that were inflicted were serious fatal wounds. Uh, a typical murderer of this in this case might be above average IQ, socially and sexually competent, cunning because they hide in their true emotions. Um, a bit like those cases where people say, gosh, I never imagined it was them. They were such a nice, polite, pleasant person. Uh, so they cover their inner feelings and inner emotions very well. Usually lives with a partner and the partner probably will not even know about their um, the other activities that they do. Disorganised shows random behaviour, spontaneous crime, uh, little planning or effort it to remove evidence and a typical murder of this case might be living alone sexually and socially difficult can have severe mental health problems and may have been abused as a child now the difficulty with these as i'll come to shortly is these stereotypes don't always fit so for example the idea of severe mental health problems what does that actually class as what is that because a few serious mental health um, issues actually people have higher IQ or serious mental health issues does lead to it being very organised. So there's a bit of overlap and discrepancies about this, but these are just general types that they create. So the pros and cons, it can help direct police time and resources so they have kind of a specific idea of who they might be looking for. Has been successfully, uh, used successfully to solve crimes. Ainsworth in 2001 argues it could be useful in linking crimes to by the same person. Um, and Ainsworth also argues it can help predict future behaviours by the perpetrators. It's so important because they need to work out very, very quickly, is this a one-time act, a one-time rape, a one-time murder, or is this going to be a progression of other serious crimes so are they a serial rapist are they a serial murderer and so they need to work out what the future patterns might be the fbi has tried to build um, up typologies for different kinds of offenders um, so for example clark and molly interviewed 41 convicted rapists and found the contrary to the perception of them as isolated loners they're often very ordinary quite intelligent and good in employment so they're constantly trying to update the typologies they're constantly looking at the evidence that they have the stereotypes versus the reality of who they're dealing with however it does rely upon the crime scene being reliable undisturbed and uncontaminated having a profile is useful but only if it actually leads to the criminal. The crime scene might be interpreted differently by different profilers, quite subjective, mythology might not be reliable. And I discussed this with my students and I we mentioned and talked about the Meredith Kirch from Under Knox case and said how somebody might see that as quite organised, how um, some of the DNA was removed, the, br um, the brick or the stone was through the window, so they tried to make it look like a break-in, how they did different things with the phones, um, not being able to get messages and things like that. So there was a, a level of organisation there, but then it was very disorganised on the other hand in that they left a lot of evidence behind um there, there was dna all over the place for example so it's very subjective how you would interpret a crime scene the typologies were usually um we usually develop from a small sample of injuries by fbi for convicted murderers and rapists so again the sample is so small is it's reliable to universalize to everybody finally can only be useful to a fairly narrow range of crimes burglaries killings and rapes and so my students looked into the David Cantor um, 
the work of David Cantor and how he used profiling to help finally catch the railway rapists, including John Duffy. So do check out that example. David Cantor comes up throughout profiling, so he's a real major name for your examples. Um, and the railway rapist case comes into profiling in different ways throughout, so do check that one out. Second one then is clinical profiling. So what is it? It doesn't use the crime scene. Instead, it uses the crime itself. So trying to get into the mind of the individual offender. Now, I find all of this fascinating. It's probably my horror uh, genre um, enjoyment that I have. I do like a, ho a good horror film or um, a thriller. And so this is very much what you see in thriller films when you um, have police or FBI walking around crime scenes. They often have dictaphones, they'll talk into it and they'll try and get into the mind of that killer. They will try and understand why did they do that? Why did they open that door? Why did they come with that weapon? Why did they do that? Where's this? Who heard them come in at that time? Where's the dog? Um, you know, is it has the door been let open so the dog could come in and out? So there's there's a lot of questions that they will ask to try and get into the mind of the offender to understand why they behaved in certain ways. It tries to analyse their mind. The clinical profiler tries to understand what the offender was thinking and what might be their next move. It can lead to insights as to whether someone is suffering from mental health illness. It can also lead to connections to other crimes to see if it's the same perpetrator. Now, this is very difficult because how can you link crimes together? So you would need a certain set of signs or indications to say that this crime might actually be linked to this crime. But clinical profiling can really help with that. And so it is time. It is Ted Bundy time. It's been too long on this course to not talk about Ted Bundy. So I'm going to give you a quick summary of his life and actions. Now you don't need to write down as much detail as this but it's important to see how profiling helped to finally catch Ted Bundy. So Ted Bundy's killing spree spanned years and hundreds if not thousands of miles. So first of all the reason why Ted Bundy was so hard to capture was because he did murders all over the country. So it was very hard to link the murders together until profiling started to happen. In 1978, two FBI specialists utilised their profile of him to place him on the top 10 most wanted list. Using this assessment of his methods, psychological makeup and known movements, the Bureau pinpointed his victim section and killing patterns. Ted Bundy only really had one target audience, young females. That's all they had. That's all the profiling was on him was the fact that he targeted young females and they profiled him from there. Bundy favoured venues that attracted the young beautiful women he targeted, so discos, college campuses and results. So this is how the profiling began, is they started to link them all together. So someone was murdered in a disco, somebody was murdered at a college campus, someone was murdered at a resort, all young females as well. So they started to understand, even though these were miles and miles apart with these murders, they, tried, they started to connect the dots between his patterns. From here, um, from the careful analysis of Bundy's style of killings, they had a firm understanding of his psychological makeup, canvassing the public and posting information about him. So eventually he was captured in February 1978, but this notoriety really did um, work with his narcissistic personality and they knew that. On the other side, you have Joseph Franklin. He was abused as a child. Franklin gravitated to, to the control and dominance of the white supremacy, uh, the white supremacy offered. White supremacy is whites only, very much against anybody of any colour or um, uh, foreign descent, and so very much neo Nazis. He shunned, um, sorry, he was often a violent supporter of this ideology and shunned most organised groups because he felt they did not take their philosophy far enough. So Joseph Franklin joined a lot of these gangs and groups, but they weren't bad enough for him. They didn't follow through on their ideologies enough for him. So he was even more extreme than the extremists. Labor Day 1976 marked his first violent attack, but his pattern would continue for several years, which crimes, sorry, with crimes um, often um, escalating in severity. So this is known as escalation. So his crimes would slowly get worse and worse. So they would escalate in how severe they were. He drifted across the country, robbing banks to support himself and taking the lives of those he met, um, who met his violent criteria. His violent killings appeared chaotic and his victims share only one factor not white 
So again, they started to get a string of killings across the country once more. And they started to think, are these killings, do these killings have something in common? And obviously the thing they had in common was not white. So they started to profile him from there. Because it was highly mobile, only the criminal profiling of the FBI enabled his capture in 1980. So the strengths of clinical profiling, this can lead to individual insights into the offender's motives and what they might do next, can helpfully link crimes committed by the same perpetrator and can speed up an investigation, so good for police time and money. This has led, though, as well to some cases being solved, like the Ted Bundy and the Joseph Franklin case especially useful for serial killings and terror attacks where there's patterns of behaviour. And it's developed in the lab but also uses information from the crime scene. So it starts to connect the dots as well scientifically for reliability. So it not only looks at the crime scene, it also then takes this further into the lab. So you do have both of those sources as well. Problems, however, it only works if the clinician is very good at it. You have to have an extremely good profiler here to really get into the mind of what they're thinking. Conclusions can be just gut feelings, intuitions. So not supported by evidence, it isn't proof that someone did the crime. Only tells the police the sort of person they're looking for, not the actual person. So you're looking for a person that fits this criteria. Well, that could be hundreds and thousands of people. So it gives them an idea, but it doesn't... It doesn't lead them to the actual person. And finally, it can sometimes lead people, a police down complete wrong avenues or sidetrack them like in the Colin Stagg case. The third section then is geographical profiling. This approach to profiling focuses not on the crime scene or the psychological insights, but on location and timing. Now, the location of the crime can indicate an awful lot about the offender, as can the timing, the time of day. When did they actually do this? So um, I discussed this with my students, what you could get from the location. And obviously, with the location... You've got to work out, has the person done it near to their home or have they travelled to get there? Was is, is the place of the murder in the middle of nowhere? So where's the nearest community? Who knows about that house, etc.? So again, it can tell you an awful lot. This analysis can lead to insights about where the perpetrator probably lives and works. So again, focusing police attention. Most of the time when murders happen and they don't have um, an immediate idea who it is, they will start with close family and friends, uh, and also neighbours, people in the area. Those are the first people, really, that know that individual well. This approach uses statistical data to do the profiling, and so you have two types. Least effort. Don't quite go next door, but you're in the area. The least effort murder. Somebody that you know, somebody that lives nearby, somebody within your area so you don't have to travel that far. Buffer zone is where you go out of your safe zone. Again, what an individual safe zone would be would be very different. My safe zone will probably be on the Antarctic. Someone else's safe zone might be the, vi the next village over. So buffer zone is the idea of you leave the safe zone and you travel further out to do your murder. And so this can then be identified in two different ways by Cantor and Gregory. So Cantor, again, the marauder and the commuter. The marauder, the home is their base and that's their centre point. The crimes come out from that centre point. Uh, um, so they always have that base. So what they have to do is they draw a circle using the two crimes furthest apart. The offender is likely to be in the middle of these two. So they basically do a crime Venn diagram. They get the two crimes, they do a circle, and they see where they overlap. So And that is probably the area in which the person is. Um, so by using the crimes furthest apart, they can work out chances are they're in some sort of central point here. The commuter, on the other hand, this offender travels away from home to commit their offences. They are often close to close together, though, are the offences. Um, so, I mean, if you're out that way, you might as well have more than one murder while you're at it. There may be a particular route to get to this place from where the offender lives. And this can focus the police station on particular roads, particular um, transport, CCTV, service stations, things like that. 
And so the pros and cons of geographical profiling. In 1986, again, David Cantor did use this to identify the railway rapists and other murderers in the London area. The types of offence it works well with are rape, murder and arson, setting fire to things. And it helps the police focus their time and their resources once more. Obviously, there's many, many strengths and, and they won't use maybe one type of profiling. They'll do different types of profiling as well. But the profilers must be confident the crimes are connected and relate to the same person. Now, that's a huge one. If you're looking at the two crimes to find a central point, how do you know those two crimes belong to the same person? Because you might have a red heron in there. If you have a red heron crime or you haven't found a body, for example, it might throw off your geographical profiling completely. The offenders don't always act in a consistent or predictable way and can switch between marauder and commuter. So you might kill people nearby your home, but then go on a jolly one day and just think, oh, well, well I'll, I'll kill somebody while I'm here. So sometimes you can jump between the two different types as well. The collection of data about the crimes and their locations must be accurate. And if the crimes are missed, this can distort the profile. So if there's any crimes that they haven't found yet, any bodies they haven't found, that could distort the data completely. The final section of investigative uh, psychology. So this is section D. This approach combines other elements of profiling to draw up an offender profile. David Cantor again is the key figure who pioneered this. It draws another principle. So for example, the offender consistency principle, the behavior in the crime scene then away from it. Crimes reveal clues about the person. So, for example, if you use derogatory language in a rape, that could be someone who objectifies women and may have a series of failed relationships. So if there's derogatory language, that might show the more power-assertive rape. Criminal narrative themes. Criminals justify their actions, give meaning to their crimes by having a narrative or a life story that explains it. So, for example, the depressed victim or the calm professional or the distressed revenger. So they create a narrative around it. And sometimes this helps them justify their actions and kind of remove that sense of responsibility from what they have done. The strengths of this is it does integrate a number of the different techniques and draws information insights about the motives and actions of the offender. So it does look at the different other styles of profiling as well. Patterns and data about the crimes can help to narrow down the search and the concepts behind it are tested for accuracy, so offender consistency. So is this a valid concept? Does it work? It's been successfully used to track down criminals. However, the theories about the offender are only as good and accurate as the data about the crimes. If this is inaccurate, then the psychological profile will not be helpful. So that's the last one for investigative psychology. My students then did a bit more further work on David Cantor. He is the man to look to for your profiling. He's the example that you can use. Right, the final section, section five of different types of investigative techniques. This now is interviews. So there's two types of interviews, experts and eyewitness. So we're going to start with expert witnesses. Um, these can be interviewed by the police to obtain their expert specialist knowledge and opinion about something related to the case. So an expert is somebody high up, somebody that is trained. So we're talking about all the people we looked at in the last topic, 1.1. So we're looking at the pathologists, we're looking at the crime scene investigators, we're looking at the forensic scientists. Police sometimes use the help of experts to focus their lines of inquiry and experts can be called to testify in court, permitted to give their opinion on essential matters. Um, and so the different types are, as I've said, forensic specialists. These were used, to, for example, to look at the gunshot residue in the Jill Dando case or the DNA in the case of Dawn Ashworth. Technical spe uh, specialists, so access to phone records. Psychologists building up that profile. Pathologists looking at the body itself. Uh, an entomologist looking at um, the time of death based on the development of the maggots as we again looked at in the last topic. So how big is the maggot? Might show how long they've been dead. The strengths of expert witnesses is very important to have their experience and expertise. As we discussed in the last topic, these people are at the height of their, um, of their careers. If you are a pathologist, you have trained and studied for 10 to 12 years, you know what you are talking about. So to draw upon their expertise is absolutely invaluable. 
It can be crucial to the police in their investigations. It can help to solve cases and evidence can lead to the justice being served. Asking people about what has happened is important technique. And so evidence can play a key role, especially in juries. Juries really fall quite heavily on what the experts say. However, they do not always get it right. And so the few cases that it has been wrong, it can lead to catastrophic outcomes and often major miscarriages of justice and we've looked at some of these um, through our time so far on criminology and so I asked my class if they can think of any and the, the, the main ones they thought of was the Sally Clark case and so Professor Roy Meadows was the senior paediatrician he's the one that looks after the children but then also the pathologist in this case uh, uh, who looked at the body of her dead children um, both of them withheld information so the little boy uh, had a series amount of infections at different parts of his body that then probably could um, lead to the idea of a cot death rather than the mother uh, killing him however both the paediatrician and the pathologist did not declare this information that they found so Sally Clark was put in prison and it's believed that she had not killed her children um, also in the case of Angela Cannings as well so I am now going to put your memory to the test are you good as my eye witnesses? We've done, we've done expert now. This is eye witnesses. So I'm going to give you 30 seconds. I've got my watch because my phone's in there. So I've got my watch ready. I'm going to give you 30 seconds. All you have to do is look at the picture. Don't write anything down. Don't cheat. So don't write anything down. Just look at the picture for 30 seconds. Are you ready? Done. So let's now have a go at answering some of these questions. How many children did you see in the picture? What pet was featured in the image? What was the woman on the sofa doing? What was the food on the table? Was the door to the room open or closed? Was the man at the table wearing glasses? Was the man drinking from a mug or a glass? And finally, what soft toy was one of the children holding? Let's have a look at the answers. So there's the picture back once more. Uh, how many children are in the picture? Um, there are three obvious children. It depends if you count the one behind the woman on the sofa as a child as well. So again, could show the subjectivity of how you um, see them. But there are three small children anyway. Pet is a dog. Woman on the sofa is reading or uh, looking at a newspaper. Food on the table are cakes, buns, sweet things. Door is open. The man is wearing glasses, the man is drinking from a mug or a cup, and the soft toy is a stuffed rabbit. How many out of eight did you get? And what does this tell us about the reliability of eyewitness recall? So what does it tell you about how people see things? Now I can tell you that my class, out of my class, nobody got full marks. I think there was a bit of discrepancy on the children question though. Um, but a lot, there was a huge range of of results some students got seven out of eight but some students got right down to three out of eight and so they all saw it for 30 seconds they also exactly the same image but they were all at different places in the classroom as well don't forget some were right in front of it some were at the side so it really shows a lot about eyewitness statements We'll come back to that shortly. So eyewitness statements, including the victims themselves, these are crucial in a successful investigation. Makes absolute sense to ask people who were there or may have seen something important. And juries often put more weight on eyewitness testimonies and other forms of evidence. Now, this is the case, but eyewitness testimonies are becoming um, questionable because of 
the fact that they're not always that reliable. People change their stories. People don't see the same things as everybody else. Sometimes eyewitness statements can be quite tricky. 1976 Devlin Committee found 74% of cases of people were convicted on the basis of a lineup identification alone. So this was the uh, in the case of the Stephen Lawrence killing, murder. Um, Dwayne, his friend who was with him at the time, did identify two people from a lineup, but it was I think it was discredited at first because he um, I think he'd either just lost his father or he actually didn't understand the idea of the glass. He didn't realise it was one way glass, so he could see them and they couldn't see and the people couldn't see him. And so he was terrified. Um, and again that was one of the other that was one of the many faults within that uh, criminal investigation. So where are they useful? Where are interviews useful? Everywhere. So the the interviews themselves are most useful, the crime scene on the street and the police station. So do you remember I was talking about that golden hour? It is so important to get the eyewitness statements as soon as possible. So on the street, on the crime scene, or if not, in the police station as soon as possible. Types of crime, pretty much everything. Anything that involves somebody else who might have witnessed it so property violent e-crime so technological those in public experts uh anything where an expert can advise as well so there are many many crimes that victims can um, that victims and eyewitnesses can help with the ones that it doesn't isn't as helpful with are things like your honor killings where people don't come forward um paedophilia or things like pornography like um, child pornography trafficking things like that because um, the victims might not always come forward might even not know their victims and then this is done very much in-house behind closed doors domestic abuse as well would be another so we're coming to the end of this uh, very very shortly the one thing you do need to know though is about how your memory retains information so there's three different ways there is acquisition what you see in the first place so when you look to that picture how did you acquire the information retention is how your brain stores it and then retrieval is when you answered those questions how did you go from seeing memory remembering and then answering those questions so that's the three different types memory acquisition then acquisition is seeing the crime and absorbing the events psychologists have found that how effectively we form a memory can depend on duration so if i'd given you a minute to look at that picture you probably would have seen a lot more but if i'd given you 10 seconds you'd have seen a lot less so how long you're actually there um, does influence how much you can remember time of day now surprisingly day or night is actually better than twilight twilight when the lights are changing it's very hard because obviously your eyes are adjusting to the changing light so like dusk and things very very hard to uh, to see things as clearly as if it was day or night time distortion witnesses tend to overestimate how long a dramatic event lasts it seems an awful lot longer than it actually is Violence, distraction. Witnesses recall violent things less accurately, probably because of anxiety impairs memory. And also a weapon focus. If someone's got a weapon, often they focus more on the weapon. I don't know why I'm, this is me brandishing a knife. Um, they focus more on the weapon than they do the actual person holding the weapon. Now that might be an evolutionary thing. Watch the weapon, not the person. Um, I don't know. Retention then. Retention is how you store memory. It's mainly affected by time, so memories fade over time, hence why the golden hour is so important. Um, and discussion of the events. This helps retention, but it also reduces accuracy. So if you discuss the ideas, even, like, even with other people, um, it, it can help you remember information, but it can also distort what you remember. Memory retrieval, this is how a witness is asked to recall events and this is so important. The interview questions, the questions that they are asked is so important. The leading questions can really significantly change how somebody's answer might be. Therefore, how interviews are conducted is important. Loftus and Palmer did a famous study to show the effects of leading questions. So the participants were shown a film of a car crash and asked the question, how fast was the car going when they were hit? The other group were asked, how fast was the car going, how, how fast were the cars going when they were bumped? And the other one, how fast were the cars going when they were smashed? Bumped, hit, smashed. All gave different answers. So speed for hit, 34 miles an hour. Speed for bump, 38. Speed for smashed, 40. They all watched exactly the same video, but the question they were asked used a different word. 
They also said, did you see any broken glass? The smashed group said 32% said yes, whereas the hit group only 14% said yes. You either saw glass or you didn't see glass. How can that change? So again, it shows how eyewitnesses are not always accurate. So think about, again, the conclusions in using this information. Finally, my students did a bit more research into the Roy Meadows, uh, Sir Roy Meadows and the conviction of Sally Clark and Angela Canning. They also looked into Roland, uh, Ronald Cotton, who was uh, wrongfully convicted of rape. We also have done Adam Scott, though, as well. Um, and then there's just a cognitive interview if you want to have a go at looking at that. The final slide to help you then because this topic is so massive i wanted to summarize which examples are best for which sections now please do not get me wrong you could probably use three of these throughout rather than a different one in every single one but at the end of the day you can take your notes into the exam so you might as well more than merrier give you teach something different and uh, you know different cases to read so intelligence databases uh, you could use paul hutchinson who made color arum and it could also be used for dna as well forensic dna colin pitchfork uh, david butler adam scott so david butler and scott so um how dna can be um, bad or, or sometimes get um, mixed up. Surveillance, you could use the James Bulger for CCTV, Colin Stagg for co covert uh, surveillance. Profiling, as I've said, David Cantor just got throughout, but you've also got Ted Bundy and Joseph Franklin if you want to do clinical, uh, and then David Cantor, David Cantor. And finally, expert witnesses, again, you can use the Sally Clark case, and the eyewitness, you could use Ronald Cotton. So, Please do have a look at these examples. Please do a bit of research. Please watch them on YouTube. There's so many ways to access these materials. So do check them out. Otherwise, that is it for me. That is it for 1.2 of Unit 3. Thank you very, very much for watching. If you do uh, give me like the video, give me a thumbs up. Otherwise, don't forget to subscribe as well because then it will give you a heads up every time I do post new videos because I am planning on doing a lot more for criminology in the coming weeks and months. Otherwise, thanks very much for watching, everyone. If you do have any comments, by the way, as well, please feel free to drop me a message, any questions, anything like that. Otherwise, thanks very much. Bye for now, everyone.